there was me. That is Sol. And my two droogs, that is Alan, a bullshit great Skype bird, and Calvin, a poogly mooge with the Sladvac Zoobies. And we sat in the Worldcast studio, preparing to waggle our Yaziks, and trying to make up our Azuduks. What to pitch as a sequel? The Worldcast covered cinnies, often tying into those soon to be vidied at the local film drone. But this week we were covering A Clockwork Orange, a real horror show work, full of the old in-out and ultra-violence. Slushy well. Hey Sol. Yeah. What's your favourite film, book, and food? Um, the answer to all three is a Clockwork Orange. <laughs> How do we eat a Clockwork Orange? <laughs> Calvin, do you like that? It's a Simpsons reference. <laughs> we're doing a Clockwork Orange. Right, are you going to intro this properly or what? Yeah, we're doing a Clockwork <laughs> Orange. This this Why was my we doing a Clockwork I, Orange? I, this this was my Enjoy choice. You. This one, the clock. Who are you? Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> uh yeah, we're doing a Clockwork Orange. This was my choice uh of film because we sometimes do individual personal picks. I'm Sol. And as always, I am joined on today's episode with Calvin. So, Oh! Sorry, it took took me a while to figure out what that was even meant to be. And uh, Alan. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and and I've chosen A Clockwork Orange because it is uh, probably my favourite film. What's um what what's contending for that? Like, uh, what's number two and three? Just out of curiosity, uh, Army of Darkness probably, and uh, okay, uh, the Iron Giant, I think. Right, enough, okay. We established you've got a bad taste in film, but what I'm interested in <laughs> is uh, I knew I knew this was your favourite film. Obviously, said that before, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing your justification of that opinion <laughs> <laughs> in this episode very much. Uh, I've got a few questions for you. <laughs> oh, wow. Are, are your knives out, Alan? Because uh, that, that sounded quite sinister. I, I, wish I, I wish I hated Fargo, so I could just push back <laughs> against. <But> no. <laughs> now, to be clear, I don't hate The Clockwork Orange. Um, but I've got... Uh, I could definitely identify a few problems with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> hmm. so, you know. Okay, then. Get into it. Well, uh, should we talk about how we came to the film, as we often do at the start of these yes. things? Um, I think I saw it when I was just about to go to film school, or when I identify as getting really into films, probably mm. when I was about 15, 16, 17, something like that. And this is obviously one, as with most Kubrick films, that people tell you, oh, you must see that because it's this landmark um you know, a, a cinema event and all that kind of stuff. Um, saw it about 15, 16, didn't care for it, didn't really like it, uh, don't think quite understood it. I think I tried to watch it again l- a few years later at university when, Sol, you were raving about it. Uh, and then for this recording, I've watched it for the third time, and, uh, well, I, I won't spoil here if my opinion has changed or not over the time but uh, <laughs> i guess we'll get into that i remember we went to a screening of it uh calvin at hyde park picture house because i i'd like did we yeah are you sure that was me? yeah oh. because th- they did a thing where they did like cult movies like the rocky horror picture show and what have you on a saturday night or a sunday night or something and i wrote like a message to them on facebook saying like do a clock with, oh God, do a clock yes. with orange, <laughs> and then they did it. And then the night it was meant to be on, there was a power cut, so they rescheduled it for the following week or something. Um, yeah. But I remember you came along, and I remember you warmed up to it greatly after that showing. But I don't know you might you might mm. have gone off it again. So who knows? Is that, did you warm up to it because everyone was throwing spoons at the screen or <laughs> watching it? Like, oh, get a better appreciation oranges, for it. oranges. <laughs> I don't. I think I'm similar to you, Calvin. I I definitely saw this at some point when I was a younger man, and probably when I was getting into films. And you start watching all those kind of those classics that you know you're supposed to watch. Mm. 
and like most of those classics that you're supposed to watch, you kind of come away going, I don't, I don't get it. I don't really know what the appeal of that is. Or sometimes you can like them, but you go, I don't know, I don't know if I put that into my kind of all time best films, mm. but you got to kind of see it in the time it was made and the influences oh, yeah. it's had and that sort of thing. And I like the film visually. I like some of the directorial choices and that's all. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I don't, I don't, there's things I don't like about it, but I don't want to get into it just yet. Mm. We'll, we'll wait till we yeah. well, get into it. I, I came to it much the same as you guys from the sounds of it. It was very much when I was sort of getting into film and it's one of the first sort of iconic, famous films that you, you think, oh, I'd better check that out. And obviously Stanley Kubrick is a, a very well-known entity. I think this is our first Kubrick film on the show, in fact, is it? Um, I believe so, mm. yeah. Actually, do you know what? I've just uh, something's just occurred to me that um, obviously Kubrick banned this film in Britain or his own choice until he died in about ninety nine. Mm. So I probably mm. saw it shortly after that because they would have been started showing it. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I must have seen The Shining and some other Kubrick films. I probably seen Doctor Strangelove at this point. I don't think it was my introduction to Kubrick, but I don't know for whatever reason I really connected with this film. It's it's very much I think the film that made me like decide that I liked film um like really mm-hmm. connect with it on a, a level other than just kind of passive entertainment because it 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 is very much a film that asks you to think about what you're watching um and I I think that was largely new to me in a lot of ways it wasn't just like mindless but also as as Alan said the visuals are there the the set design and the music and everything is also I mean it's Kubrick you know it's 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 about as perfectly directed a film as you'll find as are all of his films regardless of issues that may exist with the writing Mm, a bit slow regarding the music obviously music is a big part of this Mm. film it's very important but speaking of someone who's completely kind of emotionally untouched by music, I know <laughs> you two guys, you two guys click with that stuff a lot more. So I thought this might be something that would can, a reason why you like this film. Is 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 the music a big part of it? Oh, it's definitely an element. I think yeah. so. Yeah. I I it, it I mean it's obviously it's predominantly all classical music, so it's not like this film wrote it uh, or it was written for this film but it's all new arrangements by at the time Walter Carlos who then became Wendy Carlos a, a few years later who I think is a, a phenomenal talent because it, it's these creepy f- pretty otherworldly for the 70s renditions of classical music interspersed with just very very accomplished uh, classical renditions but you've got these sort of weird little electronic bits, and and there's a few sort of soundscapes that aren't classical bits of music um, that are just very unnerving and other- otherworldly, and yeah, like the opening uh, iconic opening shot with the funeral of Queen Mary, I think the piece of music's called, but it's this really mm. otherworldly electronic version. It it pretty much sets the tone mm. for the entire film, and I, I think it's a huge part of it. Absolutely. Well, if we can. Uh set the scene here with a bit of background um, the film is based on a novel of the same name a very short novel by anthony burgess yeah a novella uh, which was written in what 63 something like that um and it became quite a big success i, I um, have a copy by anthony me, burgess and it is... anthony burgess tossed it off in three weeks and 1962 said in interviews that ah there you go and uh yeah anthony burgess said in interviews that he was just a sort of it was just a job. He, he knocked it out in three weeks for the money. Um, so just kind of undermined the... I don't think it was quite, you know, I, I think he did believe in what he was doing and he, he, he fell out of favour with it after the film came out. But we'll get into that mm. later. But... Yeah, it certainly sounds like it brought a lot more attention to it than he particularly intended it to. Yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's discuss the book afterwards, actually. That make more sense. Let's talk about the film first, then. It's you know it's set in the near future. It's slightly dystopian. Yeah, it was it was made in 1971. Is that right? And uh, yeah. I I believe best um, estimations set the film in 1995. Although it's obviously not really important when it's set. It's just a, a version of the future, as you know. But it's not massively off in the distance. I guess is the point that I'm making. Yeah, and. Uh... It's a very grounded future. It's very much uh, 
you know, a lot a lot of people debate whether or not this film even counts as science fiction, and I'd say it absolutely does. Whoa. But yeah, I mean, I was just going to say it doesn't really have any many sci-fi um, elements. It has the, so... the treatment that they use on mm. Alex, this experimental new serum and what have you, which I think is rather crucially the the it's one of the big MacGuffins the entire film's worked around. It's not a MacGuffin, is it? It's a plot device. Um, but it, it's, it's a crucial part of the story, and I think that's enough of a thing to yeah. establish it as sci-fi, along with... But from a, from a sort of political, philosophical point of view, the idea is to just set it in a slightly different time. It's kind of like, oh, this is something that could happen. Mm. It's like a potential yeah. future from a from the writing point of view. That's what it seems like anyway. Yeah, and the film is far more futuristic from what I remember than the book. Because I, I should say, I should say, this is one of the, <laughs> this is one of about five books I've actually read *The Clockwork Orange*. So I'm, I'm familiar <laughs> with it. Um, Basically, your main character is Alex. Mm. He's a young teenager, and he's a bit of a well, reprobate. Um, and by a bit, bit of, of a reprobate, reprobate, I mean he's a rapist and murderer. He is in the book. He's <laughs> categorically a 14-year-old boy in the book, but I yeah. don't know how old he's really meant to be in the film. It's very ambiguous. They've cast a 20-something man, and I... Well, he's still at school, yeah. so I, I kind of guessed he was about 16, 17. I think that's the like idea. That. I kind of... I don't know. It's difficult to buy him as as being that old because he clearly isn't, and that is one of the yeah. weaknesses of the film, if you ask me. Yes. But um, <laughs> but I think it's also very easy to buy that in in the future, like maybe they're referring to university, <laughs> maybe school's different, and you go there till you're older. Who knows? I could buy him being eighteen. Mm. It, it, the, the the he has a creepy teacher guy who I'm sure we'll talk about yes. in a bit who comes over to his house to sort of see where he is and his attendance isn't very good and all that kind of stuff and he doesn't come across to me as a university lecturer he does very much come across as a like high school head well, I think sort of he's, he's supposed to be like a parole officer type I think guy. so Oh, is he? Rather than oh, a teacher, okay. he, he calls it. He refers to himself as like post corrections officer yeah. or something like that. And we get the idea Alex uh, has been in like juvie before. He's been in trouble and been sent to juvenile prison. And then they're kind mm. of saying to him, "Look, if you fuck up again, it'll be real prison." Um, mm. So that's why I was thinking he was like eighteen. Like now he's just old enough where if he does something wrong now, he's going to go to proper prison. Yeah. So that's mm. what I. That's what was in my head. Um, do we talk a little bit about Malcolm McDowell? Yes. Um... So I I love Malcolm McDowell as an actor in general, but I I mean this is his finest hour, very much so. I think this is a, a real phenomenal tour de force performance. Um, most of the other roles of his I've seen are him as an old man. I think it's quite sad that there's not much of him as a a young un out there from what I've seen. Yeah, he seemed to grow white hair very quickly, mm. and um, his voice dropped yeah. significantly, and all of a sudden he's playing, like, evil British men in sci-fi action And films. It's, the voice is such a big part of it, for me. Because, um, mm. I mean, it, I think a big part of it is that it's it's a very strong Leeds accent, and his parents and all these characters are, like, very clearly from Yorkshire, and yeah. that's not something you see in a lot of films, full stop let alone mm. big sci-fi productions. I mean, it's not a huge blockbuster or anything, but um, mm. it's not mm. like a little kitchen sink drama either. And it's it's quite... I think it adds to the otherworldliness in a lot of ways, um, just to kind of have these... Yeah, I don't think that's a deliberate yeah, choice yeah, yeah, yeah. for that reason. Yeah. yeah. But I, to be honest with you, right, I'm not that convinced by Malcolm McDowell in this film. I don't think it's a particularly good performance. Ooh. I don't think it's down to bad acting. I think it's bad choices, perhaps bad directing. I think he's performing it in an overly stylized way that I that just doesn't fit, sit with me. Uh, it mm. makes the whole character feel unnatural, and you can't you can't relate mm. to him at all. I think maybe that's, that's intentional. deliberate, but it, it really yeah maybe, yeah. but it really removes me. From him, it removes me from the story. So much of this and the book as well um, are, are, are really born out of that, you know, Brechtian theatre of alienation, that whole yeah. nonsense. The, the That's the entire point of Nadsat speak, is that when you, um, certainly in the book, when you start to read the book, it is just impossible to follow what the fuck is mm. happening. And it's... 
it's by design you're just thrown into this otherworldly thing you can kind of get the gist of what's happening but you can't follow it properly but as you begin to get through it you pick up the the lingo and you start to understand it and by the end of the book you're you're perfectly fine understanding it reading along and it it works and it it really adds to the sense of unease about this future society at the start but then it kind of eases you into it and i i think there's an element of that at play in the film what what did you call it nadsack, nad-sack like the, i don't the, um is that the slang that they're yes, speaking throughout yeah. the uh, throughout the film ah okay one of anthony burgess's things was like making languages i believe he uh I don't know if this started it or if he was a language professor or what, but I know he's done other work on stuff. He did a film called... Hmm. Uh, there was a film called Quest for Fire, dealing with some um, sort of Neanderthal-type societies, and it's done in a complete like fictional caveman language, and they hired Anthony Burgess in to create the language for the film specifically. I mean, I, I, I agree with Alan that it, he is a... I mean, I... I I guess we're not even supposed to really like him as mm. a character, or maybe we are supposed to, I don't know, but then I don't think we're supposed to like anyone. Everyone yes. is contemptible in their own way, or even his parents, who are just these wet, simpering, you know, uh, spineless characters. They're not even remotely parental in yeah. a traditional sense. I think, um, I, I think that Alex is... I, I don't know if he's meant to be likable, but he's meant to be charismatic and charming. Mm. And well, he's that's, our protagonist, that's what I mean. whether we I like think, it or not. That's what I think, because his actions are detestable. And so it has to be his personality that comes across. And I don't think that works because it always feels fake. Everything he does is fake. And so I guess the idea is that he's a sociopath and he just presents yeah. himself... In, in whatever context he needs I to. I think it feels very well, performative. I don't know, am I supposed to relate to that? Like I say, I don't think it's bad acting. I, I, I guess I kind of agree with you to an extent in that as the film progresses, uh, as we'll get to in a minute, like later on he, he sort of seeks redemption in a sense. And I must say, I suppose, the, the mm. way it's presented his performance you're never quite as it's presented i think it's a critique of religion and the bible and he's sort of just misinterpreted it but you never quite know if he genuinely Mm. wishes to change or if he is just playing i I, I never got the impression i just assumed yeah he's being devious he knows exactly what he's doing he wants out of prison Yeah, no, I think I think it's quite clear that he he's just going along with this experimental treatment, and he doesn't think it's going to work, and it's fine because he'll just be out and be able to do whatever the hell he wants. Um, I don't think it, at any point he ever actually genuinely wants it. I think he's just like the way he's so nice to the uh, the what's the what's the guy called Chaplin. the vicar in the church, the cha- Chaplin. chap chap Chaplin. Yeah. Chaplin. Yeah, the way he is with that guy, he's just so overly mm. nice and so out of character that I don't doubt that it's an act. Well, at the same time, there there is that scene where you see him reading the Bible and he talks about how much he loves it, but it's because he's he's connecting with the heinous, violent tacts of the Bible. Because Oh, yeah, and- yeah. And I thought that was a good gag, but I thought that was separate from his desire to get out of prison by use of this experimental I've never treatment. quite known if the idea is that he is on board with the Bible, but he's just kind of completely misinterpreted it and misread it, rather than it being a conscious attempt to dupe the system. I I, I think it's safe to say he doesn't care about being a good person, but I'm not convinced that he, like... No, he... I think he's... You get the sense, almost, that, like, if this treatment will make him a good person and he doesn't have to put any work in to do it, he'll be alright with that. Like, if it's gonna kind of get his life on track, you know, it, it, as long as it's no skin off his nose, I kind of get the impression that he's fine with it. But, uh... I don't know, I think he just wants to get out of prison. And he specifically yeah. says he, he likes the old bit of the Bible, he likes the Old Testament, yeah, and not the New Testament, which is the bit that's about redemption. Yeah. He likes the bit mm. that's about f- wrath and fury and... Uh, yeah, know, but that, that means he legitimately God's likes anger. bits of the Bible, and he's, you know connecting with it on some level and i i i, I don't know but yeah on the on the level that is not the, the level you're supposed to connect with it at he pictures himself <laughs> he pictures himself driving jesus to his crucifixion yeah i'm not i'm not denying that he's uh 
misinterpreted the intended message of the chaplain and getting him to read it by I don't know, I, I'm I'm not convinced. But he knows he's... he knows enough not to tell the chaplain that that's what he likes about it. So obviously he knows what he's doing. Guess so. Mm. I can't remember how it's handled in the book. As, even with the the narration bit, where which the whole thing is has him narrating, uh, speaking to the audience, and even that bit feels fake. Um, he doesn't speak the slang like he he speak he speaks it like it's a foreign language that he's reading off a page rather than something he's actually saying. The words do not form naturally in his mouth, and and that's my problem with the performance because. If we if we see him when he's performing, we go, oh, he's performing there. He's he's putting this fake front forward. But we at least when he's narrating and speaking directly to us, shouldn't he be then feel more natural then? When he's with his friends, shouldn't he speak more naturally then? Or at least with the slang words he uses, shouldn't that come shouldn't shouldn't that come more naturally to him? It's it's it sounds like when you hear someone reading Shakespeare badly, it's like <laughs> you don't. There's no meaning behind any of it. I've always felt like the narrations similarly very performative and like he wants to put on his best side to the audience much like he does to all the other characters and what have you and i i've never quite it's that unreliable narrator thing in a lot of ways i i've again i've always felt like that was very much intentional and like he you're not really meant to connect with him on a proper human level because the character is detestable and that is very much the point of the piece is that he's not your hero to to be rooting for and to connect with the you're meant to kind of be unsure about even how he interacts with you as an audience member yeah but i think this is partly my problem with the film in general is that i didn't get any emotional connection to the film whatsoever either i didn't not i didn't like him i didn't hate him i didn't see someone being raped and think oh my god that's horrible i didn't think mm. yay they're raping her gray yeah good old lads i there was i had no i had no emotional connection to anything that happened so i never cared about what was going on and that is ultimately what what left me quite cold about the film which is put together a generally good film well, i was going to say i think it's a very cold film I think all Kubrick's films are. I think every single one of them is unemotional, yeah. or all the ones that I've seen, certainly. But I, don't, I can't this... think of a single moment where you're asked to actually emotionally connect with a character. Yeah. But that's because Kubrick, you know, was not a normal person. He, <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, I, I, I don't know enough, but maybe he would have been autistic or something like that. But he obviously wasn't socially connected with the world in the way that most people are. I think there's a very good chance he was potentially even like a, a full-on sociopath if not just autistic but yeah he, he yeah. certainly wasn't normal i mean he, you only have to look at this film for proof of that he he made very good friends with malcolm mcdowell during production malcolm mcdowell considered him a very close friend and then as soon as production halted he like ghosted him <laughs> and malcolm <laughs> mcdowell was very hurt by it is my understanding he just couldn't like Aww. get in contact with him anymore and he, he just well, felt no. And I'm on, I'm on board with that, you know, it's like, because <laughs> like all, you know, most great artists are mentally ill in some way. It's what, it's what differentiates them from the rest of the world. It what makes them mm. different. And it, it's just a matter of being able to harness that in a way that is creative. And, you know, Kubrick did that. Um, he was well known for being completely, uh, well, for, as a generic term, insane. Uh, because <laughs> And the way he treated people, yeah, he didn't treat people like with any kind of humanity. He, he drove his actors, um, you know, bonkers, really. And uh, yeah, my, Kubrick, by the way, is my is probably my favorite director. I don't know if I've mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, uh, no. What? Why? He's 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 probably only directed like three films that you actually like. <laughs> yeah, but I I as like spoiler alert, I'm not massive on The Shining, but I think it's directed remarkably well. Um, it, my problems lie with the writing. And that's not true. I've I've enjoyed pretty much all of Kubrick's films that I've watched, um, mm-hmm. other than The Shining and one of his earliest, earliest things. Uh, there's only maybe three that I completely and utterly love. Mm. But, uh, but I, You like more Sam Raimi films. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I enjoy the hell out of Sam Raimi's work but I I wouldn't look at them and think these are so incredibly well directed when compared to how well put together Kubrick's work is I, I, I think. mean I, I know what you're saying and I think I agree actually and also Sam Raimi's style is only as much as I love a simple plan it's quite generically crafted whereas Sam Raimi 
Sam Raimi only really comes alive when he's doing madcap, cartoony insanity. That's only, like his style really shines through them, but it doesn't mm. lend itself to a drama or a western or whatever that much. Whereas Kubrick was a real chameleon, and he really did like Danny Boyle in Sunshine a few weeks ago. <clears throat> he really does jump from genre to genre without any difficulty, in my opinion, anyway. But I, I agree, and I think Kubrick is a great director, and obviously a lot of things he did, from a directing point of view, I think, yeah, often they're let down by a script, or the story that never doesn't end, um, or, or whatever, mm. and I think, for me personally, when, it, when I'm looking at things that really get to me, it is the emotional connection. If I'm going to go, oh yeah, that film, 10 out of 10, it has to have an emotional connection, it has to have a, a solid story, and those real uh, well observed characters that's mm. more important to me than the actual camera the the, the camera the, sorry the cinematic technique I can appreciate that as well but for me personally that's not as important I can watch mm. so I can watch something like Festin which is you know shot very oh, well in this Festin. in this yeah but it, it, it's not a cinematic uh, masterpiece is it because it was shot so simply but the story pulls it through and you have actually got mm. a great cinematographer there making it happen Festin's so similar in the I think it gets under your skin and because it's very unpleasant <laughs> to watch it, it's similar to this. But I, I don't know, for me, I'm similar. Like, for me, if a film's utterly, breathtakingly beautiful and, and the, you know, superficial elements are all there, that isn't enough for me if it's not got anything else about it. But I think I, I don't need to be invested in characters and what have you so much if it's a compelling thesis like for me a clockwork orange works well because it's it's very much like a debate on a topic and there's some cool concepts mixed in <laughs> throughout is it a uh, debate yeah i mean it, it, do you not think i i think it's very uh, much an exploration of, of the nature of of well the importance of humanity the nature of good and evil Isn't everything? and the ethics within them well Potentially, yeah, but that that is what it's about. It's it's that that um, just feels too broad. Um, a theme. I think you could read that into almost anything. And I, and between good and evil, I don't think there's a representation of good in the film. Yeah. There's, there's well, nothing. No, but, but yeah, but so for for listeners who aren't familiar with it, basically, Alex is this hooligan in the future. Uh, men on the moon. No one cares about earthly matters anymore. And uh, so, like, Earth's gone to to shit, and crime's rampant, and he gets thrown in prison, and then they do an experimental new treatment on him that will essentially force him to be good by rendering him completely incapable of behaving in what are deemed to be evil ways. You can't have thoughts of violence or of sexual perversion and that sort of thing. And so the, the... the point of it is very much is it right to take away somebody's very right to be evil if you take away the ability for someone to even operate in a evil capacity then are they being good or have you completely removed their humanity from the equation like they're not being a good person because they're not doing it through choice and it's an exploration of that and the book makes the point very much more the book makes it very clear which side it comes down on i think the film is a lot more here's some ideas what do you think of it um Mm, mm. i don't think that's necessarily a a bad thing i i like both the book and the film i think they have different stuff to offer but no i agree and I, i i like the film very much um i think i connected with it more for the humor than anything else because i think it's yeah. a very very funny film a very <laughs> good dark comedy i must say um, on the most recent rewatch i did which is the first time i watched it since university actually i was thinking every incidental character is yes. gonna be calvin's favorite character <laughs> Right. It yes. is a very Calvin that... comedy, actually. Yeah, and it's kind of <laughs> yeah. slow paced and um, just unnecessarily dark and cruel. <laughs> <laughs> it's things like his like uh, parole officer, the guy from the school, Drinking whatever he is, and he tea. keeps going yes. yes, and then he like at one point he like hits Alex in the balls because <laughs> he's like dragging him back on the bed. He's not trying to like get it off, get it on with him. I don't think, but there's just no. some weird. 
I don't know. And the drill sergeant from the yeah. uh, the prison, the prison officer, he's great. The cat the, lady, the cat lady, yeah, yeah. The uh, surrealist writer whose uh, <laughs> wife Alex rapes, he's hilarious. His mates that come round, and one of them was in Coronation Street. He's, he's, <laughs> I just, I just love all of the and and Alex is great. We've talked a lot about yeah. um his character, but I, I think we have glossed over how phenomenally attractive Malcolm McDowell is in this film, <laughs> and how that helps in a huge capacity. Um, well, yeah, I mean, like I say, he's... he's. I think a lot, a lot of what he's doing, almost all of his acts in this film, for the opening, certainly, are hideously awful things. And I think the fact that he's so inherent well certainly i think so inherently charming and amusing and he comes across reasonably intelligent and like mm. you say he's not like a bad looking guy i think if i was into men i'd probably be totally on board with uh, alex in this film oh uh, i don't i don't think there's anything closer to my type than oh maybe <laughs> maybe zac efron uh. um but i i think that goes a long way to make it more palatable and and some would argue that is the weakness of the film but i think it allows you to watch it so that the film can make its point because otherwise it would just be horribly unpleasant because i've seen films like this that that present much the same stuff without uh they're, they're usually home invasion movies and they're they're just thoroughly unpleasant and there's nothing enjoyable about watching them um, so, did you think it was pleasant when you were watching people being raped and things like that? No, but I think there's a... Like I say, I think firstly it's rendered less graphic to begin with, but then it's also... There's a, a purpose to it, you know? there's a it's, it's not there just for the sake of it. It's not there just to titillate. Like, the film is making a point and does have something to say, and it's... You know, it's very much art. Um, I, I agree with pretty much everything you said there, apart from that the film has something to say. I don't know if it <laughs> necessarily does, and I don't I don't think that's a problem. I, I'm fine with being presented with ideas, and uh, I think we've talked about this before with, like, Blade Runner, and I'm totally fine with there just being ideas presented and no firm conclusion made. Uh, no, but I, I think that's I think that's kind of it. The point is, it's basically saying, here's some ideas, what do you make of it? Let's have a debate. It's like we were talking about Captain America Civil War recently, and Alan was saying he, he liked that it doesn't come down on either side, and I think this film is much the same. It sort of says, look, how do you feel about this? Yeah, but the, I, I, it only shows you one side. Yeah, you don't, I don't get two sides don't, of an argument here. There's no frame of reference for well, what just do. like a, a nice, normal person would be living like in this world no the 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 two sides of the argument are is it right to remove someone's humanity and take away their right to be a person in the name of curbing evil or is that a necessary thing to do when you're basically preventing them from going out and killing people and raping people and i think that's the two sides of the argument here yeah, but when it's you... not about presenting someone being good and presenting someone being evil it's about presenting these two sides of a coin it's it's but when you put um, someone in prison you're saying you can't make a good moral decision as we see it in our society so we're removing you from society it's the same thing no it's mm. not because they're still the they're still their own person they're just removed from society you're you're fundamentally changing alex's ability to be who he is and you're changing him and forcing him to be a different person. And that that's the title of the, the film, by the way, in case you're not aware, is is referring to um, Orange as a, a sort of slang, because Anthony Burgess loved his language. Um, I can't remember quite the route that it took, but basically it goes back to Orang, as in Orangutan, which was a, a weird sort of slang term for human. And... Mm clockwork so it's basically saying a clockwork man or a robot man who's incapable of doing anything of their own will or desire and the the book like i say makes it very clear how it feels about it uh because of its final chapter which we'll get to when we get onto the book but and maybe if alex had have been presented as a younger man 
I, maybe I would have got more of that, but because at the moment he is an adult, even if he is at school, he certainly seems mm. about 16, 17, 18. So it's hard for me to sympathize with the rapist murderer, uh, you know, delinquent, um, <clears throat> when he can no longer rape and murder and be a delinquent. I feel sorry for him. Oh, do I actually? I don't know. When, like, all of his previous, um, uh, what's the word? antagonists, I guess. Like, yeah. the homeless people all start on him. His previous droogs who are now in the police. He, gets, yeah. he goes back to this surrealist writer and him and his mates torment him. I don't know if I feel sorry for him during that. I definitely empathise with him when he comes out of prison and it's very much a case of he is now, regardless of his intention, a reformed man. And he is, like, ready to rejoin society because he he, he literally cannot be bad like anymore and yet he isn't given the um opportunity to even you know try and he's treated so badly and i, I do have empathy for that uh, he's treated much- badly as a justified comeuppance of his previous behavior yeah. yeah so what he's saying is that you can say you're reformed but society still won't accept you as reformed if he'd been to prison then, and if this was a story about someone who'd been a stupid kid and then gone to prison and spent 15 years in prison and come out and gone, oh, I'm going to make something through my life, and then was not given the opportunities, couldn't get a job because of his record, someone um, holds a grudge against him for whatever, then I'd just feel sorry for him. But I don't. He doesn't, he, he's had no redemption for his acts. He has no guilt for them. He has, there's nothing, there's nothing there to make me go, oh, poor bloke. But I also, Mm. at the same time, don't go, yeah, look at him, he's finally getting his cuppermans. Because I just didn't care. Um, I I care, I suppose, but just not on a a human level. Uh, Yeah. I don't know, it's it's hard to articulate. (laughs) No, I I know where you're coming from, because I I think that's how I sort of feel about it. I I think you can you can put yourself in his shoes at that point and be like, oh, what if these people were treating me like this, even though I would never have done the things that led him to be there in the first place. Um, yeah, and I sort of consciously think, well, it's not like he, you know, doesn't deserve it, but at the same time, it's still someone being like drowned in a freezing cold trough full of like shitty water. It's still like not nice. Um, Which was real, apparently, from what my oh, yeah. uh, background research uh, told me. I was sure, because they hold on that for a long time, Malcolm McDowell having his head held in this uh, <laughs> dirty water, and I thought, oh, well, he's obviously got a tube for breathing in well, there. Well, yeah, he, it's just, he, you know. he did. Oh, right, oh, But okay. it malfunctioned <laughs> during oh. the production, and he nearly drowned. <laughs> oh, right. Malcolm McDowell got the shit beaten out of him for this film. Um, he famously he scratched his cornea in the scene where they hold his eyes open with uh, uh, metallic yes. claws and use eye drops. They like scratched his eye uh, quite badly. He broke a rib in the scene where the you know where the actor kind of comes out on stage and humiliates him in front of everyone to prove that he's not capable of mm. reacting, and he kicks him in the chest. Apparently, that broke his rib. And wow. in that sequence, he was meant to have a breathing apparatus, and he did, but it didn't work. So he basically just had to do it for real, because no one realised. Um, hmm. And it, they do hold him down for a for an astoundingly long time. It's uh, Oh yeah, the shot just holds and holds and holds, and I'm like, how did they do this? They must have had something going on. But, mm. uh, mm. In that scene as well, just the sort of detail that I fucking love this film for, and that I love Kubrick for... As those two ex droogy policemen carry him through the the countryside, uh, one of the policemen has the number 665 and one of them has the number 667 and they carry Alex in between them, which obviously Im- implicit is that he's 666. Hmm. And that's the sort of little detail that I get off on in a film. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm. Mm. How did we feel about the actual scenes of violence in the film. I, I don't know if it's just looking back on this with a more modern sensibility, but uh, I don't think they were quite as 
effective perhaps yeah. as they were back in the day and all the behind the scenes stuff people talk about yeah. you know wax lyrical about how horrific these images are and all this kind of stuff and i don't know if maybe Sol, what you were saying earlier on really made sense to me actually about how stylized it is and how it doesn't feel like i'm watching a genuine yeah you know a, a, a realistic rape as it were because you know he's singing singing in the rain as he's doing it he's, it's very theatrical it's very performed mm. it's, he's got a weird mask on as well the costumes yeah. are so sort of far-fetched and yeah yeah i never felt like i was really watching because that's the only scene the 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 famous rape scene mm. well and the the fight and, with the cat lady i guess and that scene is very much the build-up to a rape rather than the rape itself yeah. as well it's i think it would be very different if it was just lingering on him like pumping away for 15 minutes instead of like it's mm. like obviously it's awful and it's implicit what's about to happen but it's not quite the same it's not as matter of fact i i i do agree though because one of the big before i came to see this film I, it had a reputation it's known for being this you know graphic horrible rapey film and i'd heard people mm. talk about how horrible it was so when it came to watching it, I was, I don't know, I was psyched up to, mentally psyched up to um, deal with something really not very nice. So the fact that it is this very removed from reality um, affair and the violence is never that awful. Like, mm. it's it's bad, but it's not like you're seeing someone's head being caved in and brains yeah. going all over the floor and a fire yeah. extinguisher crushing their face. It's, it's not like as bad as it might be. And I think it's the um the sadism of it probably that puts people off the moral um that there is no real comeuppance for a lot of the acts that we see. Um it's not a clear cut the people who do these things are bad and they are punished. Um even though I suppose they are in some way. The but... film makes a point of letting the villain of the piece get off scot free at the end. That's that's mm. you know very much kind of <laughs> that's part of why I think of it as more of a Who, debate uh, Alex than... or the the government? Alex. Ah, you think of him as the villain. Well, he's an anti-hero at best. I mean, mm. yeah. It is a quite long film to be one of my favourites. Yeah. Um, it's about is it two, over two hours? Yeah, it's about yeah. two and a half, two two hours twenty, something like that. And it's it's also very distinctly a film of three acts, which I always forget. But it's it's very much uh, forty five minutes at the start of Alex being a delinquent thug running around causing havoc. Then forty five minutes is a prison movie in the middle where he's dealing with this treatment, and then. 45 minutes at the end where he's out of prison and mm. it doesn't really work out and then obviously he kind of has it all reversed and what have you at the end and it shifts into being a bit more of a political statement rather than anything else but um, yeah and it's the it's the opening 45 that drags the most for me um, oh really yeah because it just feels like right we get it you know we know who he is we know what he's doing yeah and i they, agree they drag it out quite a lot um like the scene with him shagging those two girls he f meets in the record store doesn't really add anything. Yeah. Even though it's quite a cool little scene, the way they shoot it, it's again a nice little directorial touch. Doesn't add mm. anything. Well, that that's a, uh... and I know yeah, it's different that... in the book as well. By the way. <laughs> oh yeah, I was going to say. No. It, Why? What is it in the book? Oh, I mean, in in the book, it's uh, it's ten year old girls, and it's not consensual. <laughs> yeah, he drugs them oh. first. <laughs> And it's it's oh. it's very unpleasant to read. <laughs> I find that very interesting that because there was obviously a choice not to do that for the film. Yeah, and I wonder if that was because, like, I mean, he already rapes and murders people, mm. but you know, drugging small children and then raping yeah. them is about as bad as you can get. You know, I think in the film it's very clearly a consensual thing that he oh, yeah. brings them back, and I I think it. It ad it adds a different element to the character that isn't in the book. It, it makes it it points out like yeah, it's not just you. This guy is charismatic and mm. charming, and he is like Sexy. capable. Like he's not going out just to kind of satisfy his sexual urges by like raping people. He's just doing it to be a 
come basically he's he's mm. i don't know but i agree that scene is largely something you could cut all together and i don't know if it was sort of loyalty to the book that they felt they had to uh include it because it has to be said like despite having a different overall message because of the omission of the final chapter this is a really faithful adaptation of the book for the most part I and mean, it's to the point that I didn't realise this until quite recently, but my understanding is that they didn't even have a proper script on this film. Someone wrote a script, Kubrick hated it for some reason, and they basically started filming the film with the book being used as the script, and they just carried Mm -hmm. copies of the book around, highlighted whatever passage they were going to work, had a quick chat about how to make the scene work and as a result 90% of the dialogue in the film is basically lifted from the book it's all very very close to what you've got in there that does explain why it feels so unnatural <laughs> just like yeah these 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 are the lines you got 30 seconds before we shoot <laughs> <laughs> but but i mean they're very unnatural in the book as well to be fair like i do think that's Capturing no, I don't think the they are though. That's just it's it, it has a slang. Like when Warren Clark, who plays Dim, when he does lines, it feels great. It feels natural. It feels like that's the way he speaks. When Malcolm McDowell does it, it doesn't. I disagree. I think they perform them about exactly the same in terms of yeah. <laughs> natural uh, yeah. speech. Personally, yeah. if anything, it sounds like Dim's putting on airs and using words that are too big for him to me, uh, and it sounds less natural, but. Was Malcolm McDowell nominated for any kind of awards for this? I feel like he might have been Oscar nominated. The film was certainly nominated huh. for Best Picture, but wow. it lost hmm. to uh, The French Connection, which is a fucking travesty because The French Connection is shite. Well, I've uh, never seen it. <laughs> and And even though a lot of people like The French Connection, it's certainly not the kind of classic that stood the test of time in the same capacity as uh, A Clockwork Orange. Yeah, it looks like Malcolm McDowell wasn't even nominated. It was nominated Best best Director, Best Picture, Best Screenplay. Screenplay, adapted. ironically. <laughs> best Editing. editing yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's weird because I, I do think Malcolm McDowell is... I mean, I know Alan doesn't, but Alan Alan's an anomaly at the best of times. I, I do think <laughs> Malcolm McDowell <laughs> <laughs> is phenomenal in this film, and it's the sort yeah. of performance that I mean, it goes a long way towards selling the entire film, quite frankly, and I I think that it's it's one of the most iconic performances in a film ever. Mm. Um, mm. So much of why the character is iconic is down purely to Malcolm McDowell, and obviously there's oh, yeah. a lot to be said for the costume design and the sort of weird, I you know, interesting things like the bowler hat and the the one eyelash, fake eyelash on one side, but. Still. You know that bowler hat, Alan? Yeah. That was them, like, sticking it to the government. They were <laughs> saying, like, look look how British he is. He's wearing a bowler hat and he's a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> so you bloody toffs in your bowler hats. So you yeah. think that all you need to do is be refined. You're talking shit. I, I, one thing I'll say as well about the production design, it's it's not that it's necessarily visually beautiful or what have you. It's it's just consistently interesting. Yes. And I think that's that's the difference for me. I, I can watch a film that looks utterly beautiful all the way through and it, I'll get bored if there's nothing there. And I would much rather watch a film that is interesting all the way through. If it's constantly throwing just weird little details and touches at me, then that that's a bigger thing that's going to carry me through something. And the fact that every scene pretty much introduces some new weird element, even if it's only a, a painting in the background or or... You know, Alex has got those four statues of Jesus stood linking arms in his room and things like that. It's just constantly throwing these weird little fl- visual um, flourishes at you. Hmm. Because yeah. I guess this thing, like a lot of the like the architecture is, it's all very, um, is it brutalist? Something uh, along those lines. It's all very grey concrete yeah. blocks in interesting shapes. Which is, you know, you can go down to the South Bank in London and see stuff like that in our, you know, uh, Leeds University near where we used to live. <laughs> uh, what, on the South Bank? I don't know, probably. 
They oh, shot right, most of it around London. I, I mean, they found just real buildings in London. They didn't... Yeah, that, that, that was that... a bit of a disconnect for me with the northern accents. Being from the north, I knew damn well what I was seeing was not the north. Yeah. No, but it's future north, so it's caught <laughs> up with London. <laughs> um, one of the things I noticed on this rewatch that I found really odd, and I guess Alan might be the best person at taking a stab at answering this for me, mm. but... Um, isn't it a curious lack of guns in the film? Because, hmm. lest we forget, guns were legal in the UK at the time of writing, time of production, I think even the time it's set, if it is indeed 1995. So, isn't it odd that no one in the film at all seems to carry a gun? Not the droogs, uh, not the rival gangs, and not the people out in these remote houses who you know, in some cases are very wary about letting in people after dark to, to use their telephone, even though they could, of course, offer to phone up the ambulance themselves from <laughs> behind the door. Um, I don't know, does that strike you as weird? It, it, I know hmm. I know it was never like it is in America over here, but they're, like people yeah. had guns. It hadn't occurred to me, yeah. And certainly those that were intending to commit crimes would uh, try and get them, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it hadn't occurred to me, actually, but yeah, it's a good point. It must have been a conscious decision. Yeah, maybe just because having a gun makes everything a little bit too easy, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, if you want to, if you want to show someone committing an act of violence and kind of enjoying it, it has to be a bit more hands-on. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, it's a fair point. I hadn't thought of that. Um, Alan, we we spoke a few episodes ago about retro futurism. Yeah. <laughs> bit of that in this film, isn't there? Oh, definitely. Yeah. By the way, nineteen seventies view of the future. Yeah, I, I love that. Cassette tapes still being used. But they're smaller. <laughs> they are tiny little cassette like mini tapes. discs. Yeah. And I don't I don't think cassette tapes were in common use at the time of production either. I I think they were invented in like nineteen sixty three or something. But Oh, and you know what? If I remember correctly, in the book he uses a disc. He plays his music off of a disc because it's the yeah. future, and they went backwards in the film. <laughs> yeah, um, the production designer looked at it and thought, oh god, well that's far too <laughs> unrealistic. That'll never happen. God. Yeah. Uh, let's see, he's got a drawer with a snake in it. Um... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does he have a wank to that Beethoven at the start? No. I don't think so. He gets his snake out, and then <clears throat> just listens to Beethoven, and his mum comes knocking. and Alan, do you, do you think he's having a wank? Uh, I don't recall that. I did see his little snake, but uh, I don't know that was connected. <laughs> well, I, I, I never picked up on it the first time I watched it, but then I heard, I remember reading people say, like, oh, he's wanking off over that music, it's so weird. And I was like, what are you fucking talking about? But now whenever I watch it, I know what scene they're talking about, because I, I looked for it. And it, like, there is a very lingering shot of, like, his kind of his chest upwards and it's lingering on his face and he's very intense and he's sort of there's an ever so slight bit of shaking as he's listening to the music and he's talking about how he's taking it all in i I do think you could definitely read it as oh he's having a little tug over this uh music here i don't think that would change the scene for me to be honest with you whether he's just enjoying it completely or wanking to it don't don't make it make much difference yeah yeah it doesn't really but Ooh, you know the the serum they give him is serum one one four. Wow, <laughs> do you know? Does that, that mean anything? <laughs> I didn't yeah, mean no, it's a reference to in Doctor Strange Love. The bomb was called CRM one one four. I mean, that's a nice detail for you know people to pick up on. Like, I don't know if it's yeah one for the nerds. Did you know that there's a pizza uh, pizza planet? Uh, <laughs> In most Pixar films. <laughs> so, shall we talk about the book? Well, yeah. Yeah, could you talk about the actual ending? Because the ending of the film, it's just Alex is in his hospital bed and the press are all coming in to take photos of him. And the minister's wheeled in some kind of huge speaker system playing Beethoven. And that's kind of how it ends. There's no redemption. No one's learned a lesson, it seems. Oh, it's, it make, it's, it's, it's a point of there being no redemption in any lesson. Like, he... The guy says, you know, he's cured, and he says, that's it, I was cured, I was cured, all right. And then you see his sort of, inside his mind's eye, as he's, like, shagging, I think, implicitly raping this uh, 
woman in mm. front of a load of what appear to be carol singers in the snow <laughs> it's to some beethoven it's a very <laughs> odd image um oh yeah and i, to- I totally get that that's the intention yeah but yeah, yeah. uh you know as a viewer i what's my takeaway from that am i supposed to be how am i supposed to feel i guess well um it's a bleak sort of like look the politicians they fucked up again it's it's like i say mm. it's the end of this argument with no clear victor on either side uh but mm. the book does have this chapter that was omitted from the i believe the american publishers left this chapter out which yeah, is right. why basically they left it out of the film i, I assume kubrick read a, an american copy and decided he preferred it to the uh original proper version but mm. um yeah i mean the, the final chapter is many years later Alex is a, a sort of mature adult, and he runs into one of his old droogs at like the pub or something. And the the gist of it is basically he's settled down, he's matured, he's left his old ways behind because he's grown as a person, and he he you know of, of his own accord he's come around and doesn't approve of how he used to be he's he's very concerned that his own child will uh fall down that same sort of trap and he's trying his hardest not to um go that way and yeah he just has an encounter with one of his old friends and the, the point is basically that you need to give people the capacity to be human beings because it's meant as a kind of optimistic message that goodness will prevail and people will mature mm. and and learn from their mistakes and come around eventually and that's very much mm. the point of it and it 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 works as a more coherent argument than the film because it it rounds up you know it's the, it's the concluding paragraph to the essay very you know it it so yeah and that's why anthony burgess was very unhappy and basically disowned the uh book entirely because he didn't like how people were misreading it as a result of the film. Hmm. And the film itself was, you know, controversial for many a reason. I I don't think it's necessarily all justified, but my take on it, what I can from what I can gather, basically there were several instances in court where young hooligans and what have you would attempt a sort of clockwork orange defense. And there are they basically say, you know, come on, judge. I only done it because the Clockwork Orange made me do it because I watched that film and it made me. And hmm. they, you know, they they were trying to kind of use it as a scapegoat to get lighter sentences. And enough people started making a fuss out of it and tabloids and what have you that Kubrick basically went, I can't be doing with this, and withdrew it voluntarily from. Uh, publication and oh, I mean I don't totally. entirely know how that even works I mean that that must say a lot about how much clout Kubrick had at the time I guess that a studio was willing to just like remove a film from existing for the foreseeable future and not make any money on it because... they only they only removed it in Britain oh is that so mm. right which is where Kubrick from lived understand... and so that he cared yeah I, I hear that <laughs> That was well. I hear that that was part of the reasoning why it was removed from viewing in England because he was getting harassed by people on both sides of the, you know, yeah. uh, people who were really offended by the film and upset by it and wanted him to know it, and then equally people who were unhealthily obsessed with the film and thought of it as some kind of, you know, ex- you know, uh, uh, Bible of how to live. Yeah. Um, so. There were um, a whole load of weird attempts to bring it to screen um beforehand i know andy warhol made a a film called vinyl based on the book which i think was a completely unofficial adaptation and i've never seen it it's not meant to be very good um Mm. i don't think it keeps much of the the book intact at all i know at one point there was a version of the film moving forward with Mick Jagger cast in the lead role as Alex and the Rolling Stones playing the Droogs, which <laughs> you can only imagine would have been a very different film. And I, I don't know, I you know, was... that might, I can bear in mind the time they must have been talking about, you know, the Rolling Stones were 
the talisman of your juvenile delinquents. They had long hair and smoked weed. It was they were anti-establishment. Not like maybe so. Direction. I just I can't imagine them being like, yeah, we'll make a film and show ourselves like raping people and murdering people in it. I, I don't know. Maybe they would, but. My my understanding is basically when Kubrick came on board as director, he was like, "Yeah, we're not doing that." <laughs> I've got I've got Anthony Burgess's statement on the film here. Actually, do you want to hear what he had to say about it? Okay. No, oh, why not? He said, "We all suffer from the popular desire to make the known notorious. The book I am best known for, or only known for, is a novel I am prepared to repudi- bleh, repudiate, written a quarter of a century ago." A jour de spirit knocked off for money in three weeks. It became known as the raw material for a film which seemed to glorify sex and violence. The film made it easy for readers of the book to misunderstand what it was about, and the misunderstanding will pursue me until I die. I should not have written the book because of this danger of misinterpretation. So he, he, huh. he completely... It's very different to uh, to Stephen King and Kubrick, who also weren't happy with each other after The Shining because Stephen King was just like, you fucked my book up, mate. (laughs) (laughs) I believe Stephen King's official statement was comparing it to a hand job where they never make you climax, (laughs) which isn't quite as uh, eloquent. Or arguably it's more eloquent. Yeah, Uh, it's more poetic. (laughs) Well, hopefully we can get to The Shining someday and talk about that, because I think... uh, Hey, the director of uh, Gerald's Game has just signed on officially to direct the Shining book sequel, so give it a couple of years and yeah, we're getting there. Mm. Mm. (laughs) (sighs) Well, that leads us nicely onto the subject of sequels. (laughs) Uh... Yeah. There was never. I, I I don't know if Sol, you you're the fan of this film. Is is there any uh, information of attempts at sequels? I don't think so. There's nothing I know about. Yeah, I can't imagine it's. I can't imagine it's a terribly. Yeah, I think it was written as a yeah. very self-contained work, and I think the film mm. was clearly a very self-contained piece as well. Kubrick never really made anything with an eye for a sequel. I know they made a. 2010 a space odyssey or something at one point but yeah i think that's the only film that ever got sequelized out of kubrick's repertoire so yeah um shall i shall i jump into mine seeing as it's similar to stuff we've been talking about <laughs> um yeah go on then yeah all right uh, I, I was thinking about this because it's, it's very much a film that doesn't lend itself to a sequel and you kind of think almost like ah come on just leave it alone guys but mm. I kind of took inspiration from Blade Runner 2049, which was a hmm. a late sequel that really did encapsulate the spirit of the original film, built mm. upon, upon what was there, worked. And the fact that there is this final chapter in the book, which doesn't exist in the film. So mm. I've really not got a lot of detail here, but essentially it would be to do a film with an older Malcolm McDowell. Um, so just pick up with him now, I guess. Said it, like, 40 years later. And um, <laughs> it's him as an adult Alex, and he it's very much a feature-length adaptation of the final chapter of the book. He's kind of um, settled down, matured. He's a decent person and human being uh, reprising that role, but much the same, he's, he's dealing with these worries and fears that his his child is gonna grow up to be um go down the same pathways as Alex. I suppose maybe you'd have to do it with his child being the same age as Alex so that he actually is going out and doing that stuff and But what age play... is that? Oh, God, anywhere <laughs> from ten to twenty, I think. <laughs> We've got Malcolm McDowell there, like the seventy year old dad of a ten year old <laughs> 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 A grandson, then I don't (laughs) CGI him. (laughs) He's got that weird transatlantic accent now, though. You'd have to do something to get rid of that. Um, I'll just tell him, like, mate, do your old Leeds accent. Go spend like a week in Leeds. Get used to it. (laughs) And then he'd be like, "Look, listen, I'm Malcolm. (laughs) I 
I, I, I am English, right? I, I do the accent. <laughs> he's got weird, like, some words he's, like, very English, and other words he's... He's one of those, like, you know those transatlantic, like, British actors who've spent too much time on American movie sets, so they don't say <laughs> shot, they say shot. And it's, like, movie terminology they just can't say with a British accent anyway. Sorry, go on. Um, but, I mean, that's basically it. You you kind of do this thing. You get enough of the original flavour of the film in there through his son. You you have, you know, the, the droogy guy reprising the role. And essentially it would serve as a companion piece to the original film to sort of complete the intended spirit and message of the book and, and follow through on it. And uh, mm. I think you get a, a director on board like... Um, is it Dennis, what's his name? He did Blade Runner, who's like a... I mean, I don't mean him for this, but just someone Dennis who's Villeneuve. a huge fan. Dennis Verdhoeven. Yeah. Villeneuve. Yeah. A, an accomplished Villeneuve. director who's a huge fan of the original and can be true to it. I, I, The more I think about it, the more I think there is actually potential to do a kind of legitimate sequel there. And it would be very much, mm. it would be a one sequel and that's it. It's not like a springboard for a franchise, but... Yeah, that's 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 me really. It's not much know. detail. Who would you get to direct that? I don't know. Uh who's a modern Stanley Kubrick? Danny Boyle? Do you know what? When I <laughs> when we when I was watching this film, I watched it with uh my friend and she said um she said this reminds me of French. Yeah. <laughs> she said um this reminds me of train spotting. Like in terms of some of the directional choices and stuff like that. Mm. Um hmm. and I think and and you were saying earlier as well how Kubrick sort of jumped from genre to genre like Danny Boyle does um, you know I think Danny Boyle might be uh, the new Kubrick I think he's just not as mental. do it justice and I think mm. he'd I think he'd ground it with a bit more heart and character and emotion which is what it would require because it's going to be the more human uh, entry of the two but hmm. yeah but it also made me think of it in terms of when we were talking about the slang and then, like watching train spotting, it's like watching another language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is, is there any? I can't think of anyone else who'd do it. But then I didn't know who Dennis Demidovich was really before he did Arrival. Like these people, they just come out of nowhere, don't they? You, yeah, you need some little art house director who's yeah. a bit nuts, but no, no one's capitalised on it yet. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh! You know who do it really well? Thomas Ford. Oh, of a single the, man. The uh, director of a single yeah, man, and, yes. Uh, the fashion designer. Tom Ford, as he's often known, I believe, as his brand. Tom Ford of a single man and nocturnal animals. I think he would have the right kind of cold, emotionless vibe, but beautifully shot and enough depth to it. Yeah, I, I think I reckon I'm, gonna go, I'm going with him. Okay. Hmm. Um, Alan, do you want to go next? Sure, okay. Um, I was trying to, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't think of doing a direct sequel or anything like that because there's just nowhere to go with it, really. I did think of um, trying to create my own, like, political commentary, satire. Everything I was trying to come up with always just descended into taking the piss out of extreme left and extreme right people. And that's kind of what I've done in the end. But <laughs> I tried to, yeah. I tried to, bring a message that I wanted to put across, which is, uh, and I was thinking of the themes of this film and about morality and uh, how that, how that is governed and stuff like that. Because I, I don't believe that there is any sense of innate morality. I think all morality is dictated by our culture, our society and, and, and the, the circumstances in which we live. There's no kind of universal morals as far as I'm concerned. As we, in the 20th century, as you know, the information age has made dissemination of information throughout the world quicker and easier. Uh, Self-determination is much more uh, prevalent these days, particularly in Western civilization. Basically, the point of all that is the changes of morals, the way the goalposts move is happening faster and faster all the time. And it's making that generation gap wider all the time as well. So that's mm. kind of what I'm trying to harness here. So here's a bit of a story that will uh, uh, take that on. So we got uh, your protagonist. He's let's call him Alex. Here he's a student, uh, goes to university, and there's this big movement to ban books on the university campus. Uh, there's a lot. Is of... this is this set in the near future? 
Um, it doesn't really matter. Is it set in the same world as a Clockwork Orange? Or is it no, just no. It's just a. It's just my take on a kind of political, moral satire. They're they're banning books on this university campus, or some people are trying to. The objections on a moral grounds, uh, mostly based on sort of religious background, that sort of thing. You're pretty classic. Is a Clockwork Orange one of them? Uh, it could be. Yeah, that was just a little nod. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, so Alex is there, he's a student, he's got a passion, his skill for writing, he's a writer. Um, he gets indoctrinated by these uh, religious zealots, he, so he starts to write um, things that he thinks will help them. He, he starts to write these allegorical novellas that show the benefit of a moral code, handed down by God, I suppose, ultimately, but you know, that kind of, the ultimate moral message that people like to think they have. Uh, he joins the protests, have certain books banned, that sort of thing, blah, blah, blah. But they have a lot of success in this, and the and uh, the governing body of the university, they try to compromise. They say, okay, yeah, you can ban that one. You can ban this one. That's deemed offensive. Okay, we'll ban that. And he, as a writer, grows more and more popular and soon becomes the poster boy of uh, art and literature for the new socially acceptable, morally enriched political spectrum. So hmm. he churns out these novels that teach religious and moral lessons. And has a, he has a way with words that makes his work very palatable, easy to read. So it really goes to the commoner as well. He's courted by the ruling elite, uh, becomes a bit of a celebrity in his own right. Uh, he gets asked to stand for political office even, but then he decides not to do that because he says like he shouldn't be part of the system if he's commenting on it. Like He, he needs to have that sense of separation. Like Russell Brand. I'd be worried that I'd become <laughs> one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. But yeah, in the sense that he still believes he has a sense of objectivity. you know. So... That's your first part. Years go by, and now Alex is a celebrated writer, but he has a teenage child of his own. And this child calls him from university one day to tell him that there is a protest on campus to have his books banned from the libraries because the material in them is no longer holds to what the young people want to see. He says they're homophobic and misogynistic. That's what they claim. And what seems at first to be an isolated incident starts to grow thanks to the ease of information spread on the internet. Uh, so this writer, Alex, he suddenly uh, is called onto TV shows to justify his work. And, you know, he feels he does this quite eloquently, but people aren't listening anymore. You don't, you don't want to hear it on 8 out of 10 cats. You just want to laugh, don't you? Switch your brain <laughs> um, Even his own children start to question the choices he's made and why they were brought up in this environment. They were taught things that they don't agree with anymore. They don't think were even true. Uh, and even when he feels like he's made a, a salient and justified moral point, um, someone will bring up like, oh, you were friends with the prime minister, though. That's why you did it. And uh, oh, you're a millionaire now because of all these books. So uh, if, as if that somehow makes his opinions less relevant, uh, if it's not art because he, he's profited from it. So he's, you know, he's frustrated. He's backed into a corner. He's constantly pushed to justify the extremes of his position because they pick out the elements that they disagree with the most. You know, there's still a good moral guide there in there. He still, he still agrees with what he's written. And backed into a corner, he uh, he decides he remains steadfast, and uh, his uh, books no longer sell. The publishers stop taking his calls. Uh, his income dries up. He has to sell his house because uh, you know his last of his money goes to uh, lawsuits or fighting lawsuits and all sorts of things. Uh, a few more years go by. He continues to struggle against this rising level of liberalism. He doesn't. He can't find his place in this new world, and doesn't feel like he fits in. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in desperation, he turns to his former political colleagues and friends. They all deny him. They've managed to more deftly switch in to fit with the new thinking. He turns to his own children, who have long since abandoned him as, a, as an extremist, who abused them with his old-fashioned ideas in their childhood and affected them in ways that only hours of therapy can re reverse. And he eventually dies a bitter, angry old man who has been left behind by so-called progress. And then after his death... <laughs> Many people come out to praise what work he had done and publications putting out these glowing obituaries that highlight the good that came of his moral campaign and how it stabilised the country at a time of great upheaval. His novels are rediscovered by a new generation who appreciate them for their writing style and, and for that, you know, old-fashioned but quaint sense of moralising that, you know, when viewed through a modern lens can still go a long way and his books start to sell again and his children cash the checks. And that's the end of the film. Huh. <laughs> Right. Kevin, take us home. Mine's incredibly short. It's only really a couple of sentences. Um, it's not terribly fleshed out. But the only way that I could envisage a legitimate sequel 
um, what the plot would have been would have to have been Alex runs for prime minister <laughs> or some kind of government leadership role. Oh, it's been um, a while since we've had one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Character runs for office. Uh, and he would slowly start to disassemble the very concept of government from the inside out, and effectively uh, bring bring uh, you know the the bring about the end of civilized rule. And uh, anarchy will triumph. Who's in his cabinet? Pete, Georgie, and Dim, or <laughs> uh, no? Are they more no. respectable? Um, like uh, like the writer guy, David Prowse. Could be <laughs> I don't know how that I don't know how that would go if Alex was like, "Hey, I know you tried to kill me, but or maybe that's a really joke." Say... The writer and David Prowse just keep trying to kill. <laughs> the he David Prowse goes, he goes, "Look, right? I look. I get it. I'm I'm responsible for the death of your wife. You tried to kill me, though. So call it evens. Let's call it quits. Yeah, I'm sure they'll all be happy with that. All um... righty, right, right, or whatever he says. <laughs> right, 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 and then. The the running thing is that David Browse carries Malcolm McDowell around in a chair everywhere. This <laughs> is the Prime Minister, he shouldn't have to walk. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> have some wine. It's like he's in the room. Knock knock. Who's that? Does he learn anything? Is is there an ending? No. Does he... But then there isn't to this film. So. <laughs> Does he join the the political party? that he was chummying around with at the end of the first film, or is it the opposition? Uh, no, I think it would be the one that he was chummy around with. I think p- part of the message would be that none of it really matters. What about if he, he starts out as conservative, then he switches to liberal because, you know, he doesn't fit in there. He sort of fucks some things up, but then a war starts, and as a last <laughs> desperate act, they turn they turn to him as leader because they want someone else to blame when it all goes tits up, uh, and then and then through some sort of pure luck, he manages to <laughs> and bloody mindedness, he manages to uh, drag them through a war. What about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that and then would he's, work. And then yeah, he's yeah, hailed yeah, no, as a I, hero I, I for like the rest that. of British history. And it's just the the moral lesson is that you know at time of war you need a mental, you need, <laughs> you need a mad bastard who will just take it to him. <laughs> yeah. 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 Good one. And if you enjoyed us dissing Churchy there, I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy next week's episode too, where we take on Darkest Hour, as well as Call Me By Your Name, Dunkirk, Get Out, Ladybird. Phantom Thread, The Post, The Shape of Water, and three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Yes, it is our big Oscars episode, and it is going to be a right old bloody marvellous thing to behold, so do come back next week, it's going to be a good one. Ta-da!